All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's class is sponsored by Richard Saka in memory of his grandmother, Becky Saka. Tonight is her first year anniversary. Tonight is the York site. So we're going to say Ashkala, Menachem, Akol, Beriotav, Yerachem, Viachmol, Viachmos, Anifesh, Rachum, Shama, Shel, Baia, Becky, Bat Shimuel, Ruach, Adonai, Tinihenna, Began Eden, He, Vechol, Benot, Ashkis, Ashok, Potima, Vichal, Rachaim, Vasilichot, Vichen, Yerachon, Venomar, Amen. So, <coughs> Mrs. Saka was known to be a pillar of generosity. She always helped whoever needed help, and whoever didn't need help was helped. And may these words be We'll come back to her legacy towards the end. But first I would like to ask the Sheila in order to, you know, I always try to look at when we come closer to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and um, get closer to the dates of, uh, you know, introspection and thinking about uh, our ways, which is very healthy, like we explained last week. If we don't make a business plan, if we don't look at the, the way a company is going, then it wouldn't be good. It's the same with physical health. And it's the same with interpersonal relationships, same with our own growth, both spiritual and all kinds of things always work like this. And it's very important to get to a moment of uh, thinking about ourselves, or like I like saying, to meet ourselves, or to look ourselves in the eyes through a mirror, and to think, and to ask tough questions, and to make tough decisions. So last week we focused on how to do that, and I would like to further this conversation in a deeper way. The Chidush that I read in the name of Rabbi Soloveitchik. And I would like to share it with you because it's of colossal importance. And maybe not enough emphasized. In order to understand what I mean by that, I would like to first introduce this with a question. One of the most important moments of any person does teshuva is called the vidui, or in English, the confession. We say a hundred of them throughout Yom Kippur. We say confession every single day by Shacharit and Mincha. And the way a confession works, similar to all other, I would say, other religions at work, but not exactly the same. We keep it private to ourselves. We don't have to share it with someone, like in Christianity, for example. But it's always about admitting a guilt, something that I did wrong. So we say, Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu. You know, we stole, we, we were not honest, we did this, we did that. We didn't do this, we didn't do that. And that's how you confess about the sin that you did. That sin has to be personal which means it is something in particular that you know you're having struggle with and you decided that this is it. So then you struggle, you say, you know, I'm sorry about that. And you say it loud, this is how the Rambam studies the, the Vidui, because the Vidui, the way we have it is from Aleph to Tav to be very inclusive. But if there's a particular thing, a particular area that you need to work on and you express that, it could help for the Teshuvah. And that's one of the... Uh, different uh, steps of the Teshuvah. Having said so, in the language of the Chachamim, there is one particular vidui that is very difficult to understand because it's a positive one. And as we just said, a confession usually is about something negative, something I'm struggling with, and um, I'm coming forward and I'm expressing it. So let's see what it says in the Torah. It's actually in last week's parasha, parashat Kitavo. In the parasha, it says the following. We have a cycle of seven, seven years, which is called the Shemitah. But within the cycle of the six productive years and the one non-productive year, or the rest year, you have the, the first six years are productive. You could plant, you harvest, you make money, and you move on. And then you have sabbatical year. But that cycle 
of six years is actually two cycles of three years. Uh, let me explain to you how it works very quickly. You make 100 pounds of wheat. So you give 2% to the Kohen. That's called the Teruma. Then you give 10% of what's left to the Levi. That's called the Maaser Rishon. And then year one and year two, you give Maaser Sheni. Maaser Sheni is a little tricky. You separate it. You redeem it for money. You go to Jerusalem and you spend it there. And you eat there. You invite your family and friends. You spend it all in the old city. That's year one and two. Year three, instead of taking this 10% and spending it for yourself, you give it to the ani, to the poor person. It's an extra tax. You give the 10% to the poor person. So at the end, it's very costly. It's about 20% in total. 2% plus 10% of what's left plus 10% of what's left. It, it comes out to about 20%. This is the three years. One, two, ma'asel sheni. Year three, ma'asel ani for the poor person. And then year four and five is the same as year one and two. And year six is the same as year three. Now, every three years, when you complete a three-year cycle, so year one, two, three, the next Passover, the next Pesach, when you go to Jerusalem to spend the holiday in Yerushalayim, there's something very particular called Vidui Maaserot. Listen this is the important, this is the key. Vidui Maasrot literally translated the confession of the Maaser. Let's stop here for a second and think. If I ask you, tell me, how would you redact that confession of the Maaser? If I would redact the confession of Maaser, I would write, you know, God, you know, thank you for the Biracha you gave me. Uh, the, the, the past three years have been very good. Thank you so much for the beracha. I may have erred here and there. Maybe I didn't give the tirumah the way I was supposed to. Maybe I gave less than what I was supposed to in the ma'asad. Maybe I didn't give completely to the poor person. Maybe I didn't stand, maybe I didn't spend well in Jerusalem, the ma'asad. This is what a, a confession of ma'asad would sound like. I'm confessing that I may have messed up somewhere. But this is not the language of the Torah. I'm going to read to you the language of the Torah again in the category of confession of the tithings, the maser, the vidui masrot. What is it? I quote, when you finish before God and you gave everything you were supposed to, you go to God, you go to Hashem, and you say, basically, I'm not going to read the whole text, but Shamati Bekol Hashem Elokai. I listened to every word you said. I brought the Maaser, I gave the Teruma, I did it perfectly. Asiti Kechol Hashem Tzivitani. I did exactly what you asked me to do. And now, God, send your Beracha so I could continue my good work. I ask you a question. Does that sound like a vidui? Does that sound like a confession? A confession is supposed to be looking at myself and saying in inner retrospection, and I'm thinking maybe I did wrong somewhere. But here, all you see in here is God, I have done amazing. I did everything you asked me. That's what you call a vidui? That's not a vidui. The first question really is, both God and you know that you did it well. Why do you have to express it? Why do you even have to say, oh, I'm a good guy? And number two, is that a confession? That's not a confession. This is a confession. Imagine somebody, besides it's not very, I think it's not refined to come and sing your praises, you come home and you go to your spouse and you say, I would like to make a confession to you. Sure, honey, what is the confession? You know, if, if it's the husband talking to the wife, she'd be like, all excited. My husband has a confession to make? Woo! Bingo, never happened. And then you start the speech, listen up. 
I want to confess to you today that I'm a wonderful, accomplished, flawless, magnificent, incredible, sensitive, kind, caring, handsome, and passionate husband and father. I have fulfilled all my duties. I have been loyal with you, to you, with every fiber of my being. I have dutifully always fulfilled all my responsibilities. I forgot nothing. I did everything. I did not transgress. I have been faithful and dutiful, committed and moral. I am the perfect man. What a beautiful confession. You could try it, gentlemen. You could go home. If you want, I'll dictate it to you. I'll send you the text. And you try with your wife to have a confession to make. And you say all the beautiful things that you are good with. Let's see if that works. That's not a confession. Why is the Torah calling this a confession? Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for how to do a Teshuvah that works. Because that's the key of the Teshuvah. Usually, the Vidui is a concentration of wrongdoings. That's what the Vidui is about. I did here wrong, I messed up there. And here the Torah, and by the genius of the Chachamim deciding to call this declaration a Vidui Masrot, the Torah is Mechadesh, something very, very big. Now, let me give you an example. The other day, I'm just checking if the person that it happened with is here. I think the person is not there. Okay, so I'm not going to give names, but there was a Hatan, a young man, who was getting engaged. Beautiful proposal, we knew. We're all part of this. And many times before they propose, or before a party or something, I like to inspect them also physically. So I tell the, uh, the Hatan, I need to see what tie you're going to wear. Okay. He shows me a tie, Rahmana de Bore Alma. It was for a funeral that tie. I'm like, you can't wear this tie. You're getting married. You're going to propose. You need to look handsome. I said, look, I have a crispy brand new tie. I didn't wear it yet. It was a beautiful Versace tie. I said, I'm going to please wear it and then give it back to me. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the biggest mistakes you could do in life is to land a tie. You don't land a tie ever. If you want, you could give it to the person, but don't land it. Big mistake. And I don't learn from my mistake because I constantly land my ties. I lent him this beautiful, it was a pink and, and purple. It was something spectacular. I still have it, but I cannot use it anymore. The tie uh, got full of sweat. The tie was not good at the end of the reception. And he said, don't worry, I'm going to send it to the cleaners. Second mistake. You never send a tie to the cleaners. They'll destroy it. But he did, and they destroyed it. So I have this tie in my closet, and before I land the tie, I think, and I look at this tie and say, I know this is what you're going to look like after I land you, but it's a mitzvah, and I'm going to do it. So I'm, that's what I keep on doing. Uh, last time, I did buy a tie for the hatan. Uh, because I got tired of lending my ties, but that's uh, the way it works. Now, why am I telling you all this? Did it ever happen to you that you are in the middle of a meal and the whole cup of wine falls on you? Yes? Good. If this has ha ever happened to you, I'm going to ask you another question. Does it bother you afterwards if some of the anything you're eating, you know, some of the juice falls back on the stain that is already stained by the wine? The answer is not really anymore because you are stained anywhere. Uh, you, you are anyways stained. What difference does it make from already stained to be more stained? 
Another example, imagine you were working in your backyard. Now during the corona, a lot of people started planting things. So I, uh, when I was in Deal, for example, uh, Vivian Heatery showed me what she planted with the grandchildren and, and, and it, they became experts at, at, at planting fruits and vegetables. And I got so inspired that when I got back to Florida, I said to the kids, you know what? Let's plant things. So we started planting things. When you plant things, you get all dirty. Your hands are dirty, your t-shirt is dirty, you're a disaster. Imagine you come in all dirty from head to toe and somebody sp uh, spills a little bit of orange juice on your t-shirt. Would it bother you? Not anymore. Why? Because you're all filthy. Listen to this, Mashal Rabotai. When somebody is dirty, when somebody feels dirty, more dirt does not bother the person. And here is the key to understanding this Vidui Maaseh. The way we do it, Rabotai, on Yom Kippur, is we come with the head low and we say, God, I'm a piece of garbage. I've sinned all year long. I'm a terrible person. Please forgive me. Guess what? That's never going to work because if I'm dirty, having some dirt on is not going to make a difference. And even if I clean a little bit of a spot here and another spot there, I'm still dirty. That kind of teshuvah does not work. The only way to do teshuvah is when you feel clean. When you're very clean and you have a small little dot of a dirt, then it's treatable. You could take that shirt and you know you could clean it. You have a jacket on, you could hide the stain. But if you're all stained, you're not going to get worried about getting clean some of it. And that's the key for success in life. If you feel that you're a rasha, if you feel that you're not worthy, if you feel that you are filthy, then you could say, I'm sorry all day long. It's not going to work. Because anyways, I'm filthy. But if you feel that you're clean, if you feel that you're a good person, if you feel that you are worthy, if you feel that you're a sadiq, if you feel that you do the best of your ability, but sometimes you have some stains, then you could do teshuvah. It works. It's a mindset game. And here the Torah, genius. The Torah tells you, vidui ma'asrot. That's the confession. A confession that focuses only on the bad is not going to work. It's not going to last because the more you do that, the more you torture yourself as I'm not a good person. Well, if you're not a good person, then why are you saying sorry anyways? You're dirty. Answer, the Chachamim say, vidui ma'asrot. You know how you do vidui? You go to God and you say, God, I'm a good person. I gave my said, I gave the thing. I did it just right. Because part of the vidui on what's wrong is also to know that I'm right in many areas. That's how it works. That's the secret of saying sorry. You know those kids who mess up all the time? And you say, why are you doing this again? I want they to tell you, well, anyways, I'm always wrong with you. Whenever they say I'm always wrong, there's nothing you could expect from them. That means that they feel that everything they do is not good. So basically what they're saying is, do you want me to correct that one mistake that you cut me off? When I made 500 mistakes in one day, because you always tell me how wrong I am. There's no way that this works in Teshuvah. This kid, he's not meant to turn around and say, I'm from now I'm going to be a good kid. No. Good people feel that they're capable of doing more good. But bad people or people who feel that they are bad or think of themselves that they are bad or think that everyone else thinks of them that they are bad? Are you thinking they're going to turn around and just become good like that? You first have to be vidui ma'asrot. In order to do a vidui in life, you have to know how worthy and how incredible you are. 
So if you don't sing your own praise, Teshuvah would never work. You have to first know how good you are, how clean you are, how spectacular you are, in order so that when you mess up, when you make a mistake, then you correct that mistake because you're a good person, because you're an incredible human being. When you feel good about yourself, then you could correct the little dots. But if you got a whole cup of wine on you and you're dirty from head to toe, then you don't worry about a little bit more dirt. And this is all hinted in a pasuk we say on Friday night in Shira Shirim. I quote, Shechora ani venava benot Yerushalayim. Shechora ani venava. I am dark or darkened and beautiful. What does it mean? Darkness represents the fault that I have, the errors that I make. But what does Shlomo Amelech say? Although I am stained by Shechora, I'm stained by black stains, which means that I have my faults too. Shechora ani, nava, but I am beautiful. I am beautiful means it's the only way for me to treat the problem. If I don't feel beautiful, if part of my vidui is not Hashem, look how an incredible human being I am. Look at all the good things I did and I want to treat the bad things, then it's not going to work. It's always together. But if you say, then it's never going to work. You're going to stay in the dark. You're going to stay in the ra. No, you have to sing yourself. Nava. I am beautiful, and because I am beautiful, that's why I'm capable of turning around. And it's the same thing in education. When you get the report card, usually as parents, we focus a lot, many times, on you know, where there was a problem. You say, how can I treat the problem? Big mistake. You're supposed to focus first on all the good things. Oh my God, you take the child with you and say, you excelled in this area, and this area, and this area, and this area, and this area. You are incredible. Overall, you're incredible. How are we gonna make it that even in that one area that you had some struggle, you could also be incredible? So at that point, what have you done? Vidui Masrot. You have sang the praise of a person who has done good, and now you're ready for Vidui. Now you're ready after knowing that you are a great person, you're ready to make a change. I'm going to tell you a story that happened with the, the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, as an introduction to that story, I'm going to tell you another story. I remember I was 13 years old. I remember like yesterday. It was after Yamim Noraim, Yom Kippur. And I was then learning in a, a school in Paris. It was Ashkenaz school, but the majority, I think, were Sephardic kids. And some were Ashkenaz. So we're t- talking about the difference between the Yom Kippur prayer by the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim. It's two walls. This is very different between the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim. Anyways, the singing is very different. The text is very different. One of the most holy texts that the Ashkenazim read, I think, I, I think it's on Rosh Hashanah that they read it. It's called Untane Tokef. Muntane Tokef is a prayer that was composed by one of the Rishonim who went through a lot of difficulties, unfortunately. The story is a very sad story. It's a known text, Muntane Tokef. And there in the text said, famously, Mi yechye mi amut, mi beshalom, the opposite, who is gonna, who is gonna live, who is gonna die, who is gonna... We don't have that text. We have a different text that is similar in the, in the Chazala of Musaf, but the Ashkenazim have this one. I remember, a friend of mine was, you know, not so religious, he said, in my synagogue, when they get to that part, which usually is very, very sad tune that they use. It's a serious moment. Who's going to live? Who's not going to live? That guy taught me, I remember till now, because it shocked me to my core. Tell me the chazan in my minyan, he decided to make a new tune for Mi'echiyo Mi'amut. You know which tune it is? I'm going to sing it to you. Ready? 
מי יחיה ומי ימות? איה איה או. מי בקיצור ומי לא בקיצור? איה איה או. I can't believe it. I mean, this is not a song that matches the מי יחיה ומי ימות seriousness of the moment. It shocked me to my core. I was a kid. That's the end of my introduction to the story because I don't know the rest of the story. I was shocked. I said, this, look, I was 13 and I was like, this is too serious of a moment to sing a song on a tone like this. Rabotai, about 250, 300 years ago, there was a similar story. Sorry, another introduction. Some of our prayers in the Silichot are a little cherry a little merry, a little joyous, when you look at the text. For example, It became like a song, you know. Some players uh, have guitars and they make... You read the text? It's one of the most solemn moments of the Silichot. Adon HaSilichot Bochen Levavot you who could read the minds. You could see the depth of the person. We send in front of you, please have pity for us. The tune is not the best perfect match for the seriousness of the text. Yet in all Sephardic shows, this is the joyous moment that everybody joins together and sings. Adur beniflaot, vatik benehavot, zochel beritavot. Well, if you read the text in, in English, maybe you're going to change the tone. Why are we singing this tune? So I'm going to tell you a story with the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov once visited a town, and they had a complaint in this town. The people of the town has the complaint that the cantor, the Hazan, was behaving strangely. They said, lately on Yom Kippur, when he got to the Al-Chet Shechatanu Lefanecha, Al-Chet Shechatanu, Al-Chet Shechatanu, this is a Kvidui. He did it in a merry melody. He did one of those uh, songs that we just did. So the Baal Shem Tov was surprised, said, do you want me to talk to him? They said, please talk to him. We don't understand why he's singing a joyous song in the middle of al chet So the Baal Shem Tov questioned the Chazan. The Chazan answered the following, I quote, Rebbe, a king has many servants who serve him. Some of them prepare the royal meals. Others serve the foods. Others place the royal crown on the king's head. And yet others are in charge of running the affairs of the country, etc. Each of them rejoices in his work and the privilege he has to serve and be close to the king. Now every palace needs a janitor charged with the duty of removing the garbage and filth from the palace. The janitor looks and deals with filth all day long. He approaches it, gathers it, removes it. Do you think they should be depressed because he's looking at dirt all day long? No, he's happy because he's also serving the kid, the king. He's removing the dirt from the king's palace, ensuring that the palace is beautiful. The palace wouldn't be as beautiful if he didn't remove the garbage. So he's beautifying the beautiful edifice. It is not the dirt he is focused on. It is on the king's palace and its beauty that he is occupied with. And the Chazan continues and tells the Baal Shem Tov, when the Jew sins, he amasses some dirt on his soul. 
when he confesses his sins, it is not the sins, the guilt, and the darkness, and the negativity that he is focused on. It is the holiness and beauty of his soul that he is focused on. He is removing the layers of dirt that are eclipsing the soul. He is allowing his inner light to shine again in its full glory. Is that not a reason to sing and rejoice when we confess? Rabotai, maybe this is why our Chachamim composed these merry songs when we say, Hatan lefanecha rachem anenu. You could either cry because you focus on the sins, or you could smile and laugh and rejoice because you're focusing on the beautiful person that you are when you are removing these little dirts that you have. Hence, a mas, mas said, the vidui masrot comes and tells you, listen, if you want to be successful in the confession, don't just focus on the dirt, because that's not going to work. When you focus on the dirt, you look at yourself like a dirty person. But when you focus on the beautiful soul and the beautiful person that you are, by singing your praise to yourself, you don't have to sing it loud. So if you do it for yourself, you read it in a, in a low voice. Then when you take care of the dirt, you know it's to beautify the palace of the king. It's not because you are focused on the garbage. The focus is not on the garbage. The focus is on having a beautiful palace, which we are. That's how you do Teshuvah. But if you only focus on the dirt, it's never going to work. A dirty person doesn't get good. So now you say, oh, I'm less dirty than before. Well, you're still dirty, my friend. No, that's not how we do it. Sing your praise. I did everything you asked me to do. That's who I am. But I may have done some things that are wrong. But first, I do everything you asked me to do. I'm a pioneer. I'm a servant. I'm a good person. I try to do the best of my ability. And then I have some mistakes much different than saying I'm a piece of garbage. Or a piece of garbage never gets clean. It's always a piece of garbage. I'm not a piece of garbage. I'm a great guy. That's what the Chachamim teach us with Vidu Imasra. That's how you do Vidu. When you say how great you are also. The Baal Shem Tov, after this story, composed three lines. And he said, just as when you look at the earth, you can never estimate how many treasures are hidden beneath its crust. Diamonds, gold, marble. How many treasures are inside the rock? Do you see it? You don't see it. It's there. So too. When you look at yourself, you can never estimate how many treasures lie beneath your crust. This is how you do Teshuvah. If you do Teshuvah like this, then it works. Let's sing our own praises a little bit. I was asking someone this week, do you think it was easier to serve and observe the Torah 200 years ago, say, for example, or now? So it's hard to compare because we don't know exactly what 200 years ago looked like, but we could project and, and do some analytical uh, work. And from one side, you want to say, well, it's much easier these days. Kosher is available. Look, Victor is in a restaurant. It's kosher. It's good. It looks okay. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, I don't know if they had that 200 years ago. Did they have such beautiful restaurants like, like where you are, Victor? They, they didn't have that. Kosher meat served to you, with waiters, the whole nan yards. It's great. Enjoy the wine. So they didn't have that. 
Today you go to shul, it's a pleasure, it's beautiful. Maybe back then also, I don't know. I don't know, it's just, we feel it's much easier today because everything is so accessible. You could even be on your couch like Jack, watching a shiur, you know, back then you had to go in the rain to go to class, to the, ah, so hard. Now you could, you press the button, uh-huh, you listen to the class from the commodity of your house. It's easier to serve God. Now you could choose to watch Netflix now instead of watching a boring rabbi from Florida. But you chose to listen to Torah. Chazak Kubaruch, good choice. So is it easier? It is more technically easier. But the tests that we have these days, I don't know. I mean, the tests of Kiddusha, the moral level of the world is just unbelievably low. I don't know. It's a good question to ask ourselves. According to the Hasidic thinkers and the Kabbalistic thinkers, they say that the more you advance in the world, the more the Tum'ah grows the more impurity you have in the world. So I guess to work, to serve God with, with the impurity around, it, it, it is harder. It's more valuable. It's, it's much harder. I'll give you one line. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I'll give you one line. A, a, a big educator told me once. He said to me, you have to understand a teenager today has much more Nisayon than he used to be before. That's definitely true with a smartphone, etc. The Nisayon is just so big. I don't know how they do it. The kids are having a difficult time. You know, God bless them. And they go to school and they stay true to the religion. So difficult. He told me one line. Abotai, listen up. Again, I remember it because it was years, maybe 20 years ago, but it's so powerful. I remember it forever. He said, listen to me. What a kid at 14 years old, what a boy at 14 years old, could see in one picture, could have more dirt than what a man saw in last generation in 75 years. One picture, more than 75 years of a normal person. How do you deal with that? Two eyes big. We have to tell them that. Before we scream at them, before we tell them you're not right here and you're not right. They keep the mitzvot. They, they go to school, they learn Gemara. Some Gemara that was written 2,000 years ago. The true the tradition that is 2,000 years old. They have this, you're not, we didn't have this, this, you're not growing up. And the more we advance and the more complicated it gets. And they're still in the Derech HaTorah. These are angels. They're not human beings. They're angels, these kids. If they know they're angels, if we tell them, you tzaddik, I don't know how you do it. You put them here to the highest, when they're the highest and they have a mistake. The clean, amazing palaces that have some dirt on the floor. It's easy to clean. If they feel low, if they feel like a failure, like many teenagers feel, after hearing too much, how bad they are, what do you expect from them? A dirty person doesn't mind getting more dirty and doesn't worry about getting cleaned a quarter of himself. Tell them how great they are. Not only them, yourselves. Think about yourselves, how great you are. Then you take care of the problems. When things are working, you want to get better. When things are not working, you give up. Same in business. If a business is, everything is not working, sometimes you say, right, it's time to close. If the business is booming, just some areas that needs a little, you know, a little uh, fixing here and there, you fix it. You, you use everything you could to fix it. Same with us. If we feel like a failure, we're not going to fix it. You could say, Hashem Bagan all day long, it's not going to work. No, I'm not that. I'm a great person. I try serving God. I'm a nice person. I give charity. I keep Shabbat. I keep Kashrut. I'm nice to my peers. I'm, sometimes I, I, I send, uh, you know, tough messages to the rabbi, A.B. Malik. But overall, I'm a, I'm a great guy. Overall, overall. Okay. It's fine. 
coming from you, it's okay. <laughs> Rabotai, that's the way to approach Teshuvah. If we approach Teshuvah with the head down, it's not going to work. If we approach Teshuvah with the head up, head high, it's going to work. That's how we have to think about ourselves. Very important. And all this was composed by the Chachamim calling a praise on ourselves, vidui, confession. Confession is two parts. One main part, but how great we are. One small part, but the problems we have to fix. The problem is that in the books of prayer, it only focuses on the problems. Well, we can't get carried by that. We have to focus before we open the book of prayer, how great I am. So now I'm fixing the mistake. We'd like to conclude today's Derasha with one story. The story is a story told by Rabbi Abraham Tversky, the famous psychologist. He says a story on the name of Rashlom Shneor Zalman of Liadi. This Chacham went to a city because he needed to um, fund, uh, raise funds for a family that was captive, Pidyon Shivui. He needed to do that. It was a terrible situation. He needed a lot of money. At the time, 5,000 rubles. And he went from city to city, he went to a famous city where there was a miser there, known wealthy man who did not give tzedakah. Everyone told him, don't even try. The guy always does the same thing. Gives you old, rusty copper scent, gives it to you, and nobody wants it. Return it to him, and that's it. Rav Shnur Zalman said, I want to go meet this person. He took another two people with him. He said to them, on condition, you don't say anything. They go to the person. They knock on the door. They escort them inside. Beautiful, lavish house, gorgeous. Say the man is going to be here in a minute. He comes down, he comes, oh, gentleman, rabbi, so nice to have you. And the rabbi starts his speech. He says, you know, uh, we have a situation and this is a situation, etc." And he said, oh, of course, this is unbelievable. He says, I would love to help you. He says, please give me a minute. He goes to the safe. He takes out a little pouch and there's a rusty old coin, copper coin, he takes out and he gives it to the rabbi. And the other two people who escort the rabbi say, they're they thinking, you know, sure, we knew that that was happening. He said, worthless. The rabbi shows them, he says, we had a deal, don't talk. He takes out a piece of paper and he writes, dear, he asks him, what's your name? His name is whatever, Ploni. Dear Ploni, thank you so much for the generous donation you gave me. This will help this family who is captive right now. I want to bless you and give you the beracha. He tells him, Panasa, good health, good from the kids, nachat, etc. He gives him the paper and says, Beracha, Latzracha, thank you so much. He turns around and he leaves. The other two people, they don't understand what is he doing. For one cent that he gave him, an old copper coin that is worthless. He motions to them quiet and they continue walking. But 10 seconds after they left, they hear the voice of the miser. He says, Rabbi, Rabbi. He says, yes, please come back into my office. He comes back into his office and the miser says, how much is the whole amount that you need to collect? He says, 5,000 rubles. He says, Rabbi, I'm very touched by the story. I would like to give 1,000 rubles. Oh, wow. Sure, that's unbelievable. Thank you so much. He comes, he brings the money, fresh coins, a thousand rubles, and he gives it to the rabbi. The two people that look at this, like, this is incredible. He never gave a dollar in his, in his life in tzedakah. He turns around, and he lives again. He gives him beracha. Thank you so much, Mashem. Bless you, and you're going to see how much beracha you're going to get from that. They turn around, and they leave. And then they hear, 10 seconds later, after they left, there's somebody, somebody playing the shofar outside in my neighborhood, can you imagine? Oh, it's the Mashiach, huh? No, I don't think so. It's too late this time. And this miser who called him and says, um, Rabbi, I need to talk to you. Please come back. 
He goes back inside the office, says, Rabbi, what's the whole amount? Says 5,000 rubles. 5,000 rubles, Rabbi, after thinking a little bit, I would like to give the whole amount. Here is the other 4,000 rubles. You got it. Go and save these people. They come out of there, and the other two people, the other two rabbis who were escorting this rabbi, said to him, how did you do that? How did you do that? The guy never gives tzedakah. How did you transform him into giving tzedakah? He says, this man was no miser. This man is no uh, stingy. No Jewish person is stingy. It doesn't exist. It comes from Abraham Avinu. He's generous. But how could he want to give if he never in his life experienced the joy of giving? Everyone to whom he gave that rusty penny threw it back in his face. That's why he never experienced the joy of giving. But once I gave him the experience of giving, he tasted it, he loved it, he connected with it, and he gave. When you talk to a person about his bad vida, you get nothing out of him. When you talk to a person about his good vida, you get everything out of him. When I say everything, every good out of him. When you focus on how bad you are, no good will come out of it. When you focus on how great you are and how clean you are, that's how you clean dirt. And that's how tzedakah works. And that's how mitzvot work. That's how everything works. And this is perfect and apropos to Ilui Neshama of this great woman, Becky Saka, who was such a matriarch of tzedakah. That everybody would go to her to get tzedakah. Once you know how good you are, once you know how great you are, you give. You feel good about it. It's going to be hard these days a lot of people are having difficulties. When a person makes an effort, Hashem sees. Hashem is paying attention to this. He gives more berachat to the person. It goes by the effort. But not only about God, it's about ourselves. When we give, or when we do mitzvot, when we do good things, we focus on the good that we have. And when you see how good you are, you want to be better. If we focus on our dirt, it doesn't work. So let's make ourselves a favor. And let's restate, and let's restore, sorry, the real, the real vidui, the real confession, the way it is in the Kali Israel. Before you say how bad you are, before you say, I'm sorry, God, for all the bad doing I did, take two minutes and say how good you are. And say to God, I'm a great person. I did a lot of good this year. I was tremendously connected to you, spiritually, through my mitzvot, through my attitude. Do that. Say it. Don't sing it. Don't take the mic. Don't say it to anybody other than yourself and God. And then, when you're ready, when you feel like you have a palace, when you see that everything around is beautiful, when you are this successful human being, then that means that you're ready to say, I'm sorry. I also did some wrong things that I could have done better. If you did not reach that point that you feel good about yourself, then don't say tachanun. It will be destructive. It will not be constructive. Tachanun, vidui, only come as a building tool, not a destructive tool. That's why the Chachamim decided to call this Vidui Masrot. That's a Vidui. That's how you do a confession. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Shabbat Shalom Mevorach to you. And please do that. Please do that. Before you do how bad you are, please sing yourselves. Shechora Ani Venava. I may have some Shachor. But I'm never a beautiful person. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.